morning to all of everybody. We are live, by the way. Uh, good job, poor job. Uh, we are uh, We're going to get started this morning in a little bit different. I'm going to come up here to say a couple things. Uh, so I want you to know, first and foremost, we want to celebrate uh, Mother's Day. So I want to say Happy Mother's Day to everybody. So we were supposed to have a couple of kids come over and hand out the flowers, but I do not see the children yet. Maybe they'll come in here in just a minute. So in the meantime, what I'm going to ask is if you are a mother, if you'll stand up today. We did this in the first service. Let's do it in the second service. Stand up. Everybody stand up. And uh, Joe, if you'll help me back there. If you guys will hand out the flowers for me back there. Now, uh, uh, if you're a mother, stand up. If you're not a mother, sit down. Yes, thank you. So I want to say, first and foremost, we're going to celebrate the mothers that are in our church always, and we really love and appreciate you guys. But I also want to acknowledge that this is not that this is not always an easy day for everyone. Mother's Day is a difficult day for some people. And so I want you to know that in reflecting on that, we've definitely been praying for you specifically that, are, that will struggle with this day. So as you guys get your flowers, go ahead and have a seat. We, I, I've been praying for you guys specifically who I know will struggle with this day of Mother's Day. So I want you to know that we are going to celebrate Mother's Day, but I also acknowledge that we love and we care for those of you who are struggling today. And if you guys need anything, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, so, all right. So, happy Mother's Day. We're waiting to get the flowers. I see you. Uh, we're waiting to, we're right, waiting to get the flowers handed out, and then we're going to turn it over. Here's what we'll do. Yes. What's that? Oh, yeah, we want to thank everybody for that. Yeah, so we had a, an amazing cereal donation. We did the drive for the, the, uh, the, the cereal boxes in the back of the school bus. What was the final total on boxes that you guys collected totally? 590. 500 and wow. wow. So, so thank you guys for all who contributed. That's going to go to feed children during the summer. Um, so it's like feeding Tampa Bay. So I appreciate you guys doing that. All right, so as we're handing out the last bit of flowers, love you mothers, happy Mother's Day to everybody. And then what we're going to do is I'm going to turn it over to the band to get started. Good morning, family! Good morning. Now that you've had a seat, guess what I'm going to tell you to do? You know what I need? Jesus. Amen. So Jesus, Jesus, take my hand. Let's do it. Oh, my little world that has no shame. 
showed me what it means to be a man. Every day he shows me what it means to be a man. He's going to show you what it means to be a child of God. Come on and sing with me.
Well, here we go. Uh, we, we finally finished with the book of Colossians last week. It took us a little while, but we got there. And so this week we begin our new series in the book of Habakkuk. And I know some of you were saying, why are you saying it that way? I'm saying it that way because in the Hebrew, the first A is a little quieter, and the second one is where the stress is. So it's Habakkuk, okay? That's how I'm saying it. Um, it is a little strange to say, I have to be honest with you. This is a really cool book, and I'm, I'm hoping that you'll enjoy this as we begin to work through this over the next few weeks. And then, of course, we'll jump back into the New Testament afterward. You know, we get a new, old, new, old, and we bounce back and forth. So, this week we're going to begin in Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. I want to read this to you first, and then we're going to start looking at what's going on, and I'm going to give you a little bit of background, and a little bit of context, and maybe even a little bit of detective work uh, to try to figure out some of the things going on. So let's read God's Word, where it starts in verse 1 of chapter 1 of Habakkuk, where it says the prophecy that Habakkuk the prophet received, How long, Lord, must I call for help? But you, don't, you do not listen, or cry out to you, violence! But you do not save. Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore the law is paralyzed. And justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous. And that justice is perverted. Look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed. For I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe, even if, I, even if you were told. I am raising up the Babylonians, the ruthless and impetuous people, who sweep across the whole earth and seize dwellings not their own. They are feared and dreaded people. Uh, they are a law to themselves and promote their own honor. Their horses are swifter than the leopards, fiercer than the wolves at dusk. Their cavalry gallops headlong. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle, swooping to devour. They all come intent on violence. Their hordes advance like the desert wind and gather prisoners like the sand. They mock kings and scoff rulers. They laugh at the fortified cities. They build earthen ramps and they capture them. Uh, they are, um, and then they sweep past like the wind and go on guilty people who, uh, whose strength is their God. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to start with looking at this first point, which is question one. And you'll notice it says question one because he gives, them, he gives God two questions. So this is a strange thing to even start with, but he tells us in verse one that he's a prophet of God, and yet here he is questioning God. You would think if you had a relationship with God, you wouldn't need to question him. But I think that what we're going to see as we work through is that questioning God is a human and a real thing that happens in the hearts of many of us. And it's not a bad thing. It's a real thing that happens in our hearts. And so I want to begin by just saying that Habakkuk is a very interesting book in the sense that nobody seems to read Habakkuk. Um, it is one of the 12 minor prophets. Most people know nothing about the book at all. I was telling uh, the, the, the first service that I have never heard a sermon preached out of the book of Habakkuk. Never in all my years. I have never preached a sermon out of the book of Habakkuk until today. And I just did this morning. But what I will tell you is that it is not a book that is focused on. When I was in school, I don't think we've ever seen a Bible study ever in my history either on this. But one time when I was in school, we were going through the Old Testament in a deep dive study, and we spent one whole class doing Nahum and Habakkuk. So Habakkuk got about an hour. We got around an hour of our time. We went through it, and when we were done, we were done. Nobody ever really stopped and looked at it. And so as I was looking at this book and studying it, I really got kind of excited because it is kind of an, an untold uh, gem or an untold story that becomes a gem in our hearts when we see it because there's so much reality in here. But there's also a lot of things we got to figure out. First of all, who's Habakkuk? Well, that's a really good question. We have no idea. Uh, there's really no historical context for him at all. He doesn't exist in the Old Testament other than twice. His name shows up in verse 1 of chapter 1 and verse 1 of chapter 3. That is it. So we cannot find any other references to him in the Old Testament. So it, it makes us kind of become detectives. So we start digging in and going, we don't know anything about it. We don't know if he was married. We don't know if he had kids. We don't know where he lived. We're trying to figure out when he lived. And so we start doing a little bit of investigation. There's a couple things that stand out to us. In the writing of the Hebrew, it definitely seems to give descriptions that are very common to the temple. So some people have said, well, there were prophets that worked in the temple in different times. 
It's very possible that he's one of those prophets that worked in the temple. Okay, well, that's a good theory. That's good. We, we don't know if it's true, but it's a good theory. The other thing that comes up is when you look at rabbinic tradition, actual Jewish rabbis, and how they study the passage, they say, some of them, that he is actually the watcher on the wall mentioned in Isaiah 21.6, because they could have been contemporaries. And the reason they say that is because in chapter 2, verse 1, Habakkuk mentions standing on the wall at watch. And so they have taken that to mean maybe he's that character in Isaiah, right? They're still trying to figure it out. I think the most interesting thing that came up is there's an extra biblical text, which is an augment to the book of Daniel that the rabbis use when they're studying the book of Daniel. And in that book, they mention that Habakkuk was a prophet that actually ministered to Daniel while they were in Babylon. So that, that's, a, that's not a biblical text, so we don't know if that's true or not, but that's something that the rabbis use when they're studying. So we know very little about Habakkuk, but we can begin to figure out the time period. And here's why, because if we're detectives, we see that he begins to mention that the Babylonian Empire is on the rise. It's not in power yet, but it's on the rise. So we know that what happened to the people of Israel was that there was one kingdom. That kingdom become, became divided. There was the northern kingdom, which was to the north called Israel, and the one to the south was called Judah. They had two separate kings. Now we know that the Assyrians come in, and they wipe out the northern kingdom at about 742 B.C. They destroy it. It doesn't exist anymore. So all that's left is Judah. So at that point, this is probably in that time zone of when he is. Because Babylon has not come to full power yet, but, he's, but he, they're on the way. So the other thing we can kind of delve into this is because Babylon is rising in power, but has not invaded yet. In 597, we know that they could do the first incursion into Judah, and they take Daniel and so many people back to Babylon with them. That's that first incursion. So that has not happened yet. So now we're beginning to zero it in. So here's how I zero it in. In 612 BC, that's when the Assyrian capital was sacked by, I love this name, Pharaoh Necho. And no, he's not related to the candy. He not, has nothing to do with the candy. Although if he was one of those Necho wafers, he would be the licorice one because that one's horrible. And I do not like that one at all. And this is not a good dude. So anyway, uh, Pharaoh Necho actually sacks the capital of Assyria. Assyria then become, became, begins a steady decline down. And soon after that, Babylon rises up. So it has to be somewhere after 612 B.C. Remember, B.C. goes backwards. I'm going to estimate that it's somewhere around 608, 605, somewhere in that range. And so that would put him firmly in the middle of the period just before Babylon comes in for the first incursion in 597. Why does all this matter? Well, it matters because of the question that he's asking. Look very closely at the questions. He begins to say, how long, O Lord, must I call for your help? But you're not listening to me. Anybody feel that way? Yeah. He says, or cry out to you violence. The word violence means wrongdoing or wickedness. He sees all this wickedness and wrongdoing. And he's crying out, look, look, violence, bad stuff. And it says, but you don't say. He says, why do you make me look at the injustice, the evil of the world? Why do you tolerate this wrongdoing, this violence going on? He says, I look around and there's destruction, there's, there's violence, there's strife, there's conflict, there's disputes, and yet you're not doing anything. So here's a prophet of God questioning God on why he's not moving in the way that he wants him to move. I want you to know again, I'm going to say it again to you, that questioning God is a human response and is not inappropriate. I'm going to challenge you to continue to ask your questions and continue to seek God's answers in every way that you can. Pray, seek Him, get into His Word, ask those tough questions. But I'm also going to tell you, you may not like, and you're not going to like all of His answers, and He may not res resolve the things the way you want Him to resolve the things. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. So, He says, absolutely, here's my questions. So if you're going to question God, I'm going to ask you to do it in the right method and in the right motivation. So in other words, we don't come before God in a prideful, arrogant way like, what's your problem? Do what I want you to do. But instead, you come humbly saying, God, what's going on? I need your help. And what's your motivation? Are you trying to question God because you're upset with Him, that you're just ticked off, or are you seriously seeking an answer? That motivation is legit. You can go before God. I'm going to be honest with you. If you've not read the book of Psalms, David comes before God pretty angry at times. 
Why does the wicked prosper? Why do the evil get away with it? Very similar to what you see in the back end. And so that's okay. We can come before God and do that. But on another level, when I read these questions to you about Him saying, How long, O oh Lord? How long am I going to cry out to you and you're not going to listen to me? How long, O oh Lord, is this violence going to go on and you're not going to save us? Am I the only one that looks at our world and says, God, help us? Yeah. Am I the only one that looks at our country and says, Lord, we need your salvation? Yeah. That our country has fallen apart in so many ways and it's still the greatest country on earth and I love it to death, but God, help America. Amen. Because we are in need of help. And so we cry and we ask and we pray and we say, Lord, why aren't you doing it? Why aren't you doing it? And our heart cries out like a backing. As he says, what's going on, Lord? Why are you making us wait? Why aren't you doing something that we want to happen? And I want you to see that some of the things that are going on in his world are even more similar than you think. You see, in this time period, the king that was existing in Judah was a guy named Jehoiakim. Now this guy is a politician's politician. This dude is so crazy and he waffles over all kinds of things. We're back to Pharaoh Necho. I'm going to tell you what happened with him. Pharaoh Necho comes into Jerusalem and Judah and he takes control. Kicks Jehoiakim's brother, younger brother, out of power and puts Jehoiakim on the throne and says, Now you're going to rule Judah, but you're going to work for me. So he begins to serve Egypt and not serve God. He is not a king put on the throne by God at all. And so there he is. he is. He is absolutely not the correct king, and he does whatever he wants. And then over a period of time, he begins to see that Babylon gets a little stronger than Egypt. So he waffles, and he reaches out to Babylon, and now becomes a vassal of Babylon, starts sending tributes to Babylon, and he forgets about Egypt again. He says, oh yeah, I don't care about you guys anymore. I know you put me in power, but who cares about that neck of you? I don't like licorice. So he says, forget about it. But then Babylon has a huge setback. One of their capitals is, is damaged in a war. And he looks out and says, oh, well, maybe Egypt is coming back into power. And so he turns around and goes back to Egypt and stops sending tribute to Babylon. That is what causes the initial incursion of Judah in 597, where he is taken into captivity, Daniel is taken into captivity, and many others were taken at that point. But it's not just his politics that are messed up. He's not just one of these people who checks the winds and figures out what's popular to do at that moment. That didn't sound familiar at all. But it's also, he's a wicked man. As I started looking at some of the rabbinic literature that speaks about Jehoiakim, there's several things that come out. They call him a godless tyrant. They say that he committed atrocious crimes. And they even mention the fact that he lived in an incestuous relationship with his mother, his daughter-in-law, his stepmother, and he had a habit of just murdering men and taking their wives because he liked them. Not just that, but if he liked your property, if he just thought your property had a nice view, he'd just come in and kill you and take it. This is just a guy who takes and takes and takes for whatever he wants, and he's evil at the core. And so when you see what's going on, and then you hear what Habakkuk is saying, he sees all this evil, he sees all this strife, he sees all these bad things going on, and he's like, listen, this is a mess. And in verse 4, at the end of the questioning God, the first question, he tells God what the results are, as if God doesn't know. He tells God what the results are of a nation that lives this way. And I'm going to read verse 4 to you, and I want you to think about our own nation. He says, therefore the law is paralyzed. You see, the law is supposed to determine what's right and what's wrong. The law is supposed to say this is what we should do and this is what we shouldn't do. The law is the, the, the measuring stick. It's the determination of how we live and what we should do. And he says, listen, it's paralyzed. No one's even using the law anymore. He says, justice never prevails. Instead, injustice rules now. The right thing is not being done, but instead the convenient thing is being done. In fact, when you look around at our world today, do you not see that we have moved into a world where right and wrong do not exist, but instead now we just do whatever we want through what's called situational ethics? Yeah. People say, oh, it's right for me to do today, but tomorrow when it's inconvenient, it's wrong, I'm going to do whatever I want. Instead of saying there's a right and a wrong, we make up excuses of why it's okay to do what we want to do at this point. And that's exactly what was happening here. He says, the wicked him in the righteous... You see, the people who were trying to serve God, trying to do the right thing, were feeling surrounded. They were feeling trapped. 
They were feeling herded into places and into situations that they didn't want to be in. Does that sound familiar? When you look at our nation and you see these words, he says, so that justice is perverted. What some things, what some people are calling right is clearly not right. And that is now accepted as the norm in the Baptist world. Well, I'm going to tell you people of God, when I look at America, all I can say is God help us. When I read these verses, I think to myself, America is a place where the law is paralyzed. America is a place where justice doesn't seem to ever prevail. America is a place where the wicked are hemmed in and trapped. And trapped the righteous, I should say. And it's a place where the justice that should be held up and seen as the right thing to do is now considered perverted. It does whatever it wants to do. Our country is a mess. And what we honestly need right now is Jesus. And so Habakkuk cries out. But I want to bring to your attention one more thing about his question before we go any further. Because we're going to jump over to God's answer. Am I the only one who noticed that as he's questioning God, he never once, never once acknowledges the responsibility of Judah for their own actions? Why are you making me see all this, God? Why are you making me see all this injustice and this violence? Why haven't you fixed it? Without saying, you know what? I live in an evil place where people do evil things and we have done wrong and I'm repenting before you, O oh God. He does not come with repentance, but rather with an accusation of why haven't you changed it the way I want you to change it. I want you to hear me very clearly, people of God. Our country needs to repent and turn back to God. So even as we pray and we ask the Lord to move, and we need to acknowledge that the mess that we're in is by our own hand and by our own rebellion from God and His work. And that doesn't just mean the country in general. It means even in our own personal lives we fail. So acknowledging that repenting is huge. He doesn't allow Judah to take any, any responsibility here at all. And they have. They have responsibility in this situation, just as we have responsibility in the situation of our country. The answer comes from the Lord. And here's what I'm going to do with this. I've read it to you. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to actually do with the answer here. I'm going to, I'm going to tell you that answer, the answer one really begins in verse five. And verse five is where we're going to focus most of our time and most of our attention. But before I get to that, I want to go and just look at six through 11 just very briefly. And I want to explain to you why I'm going to do that. Because I believe verse five is the message directly given to Habakkuk to be given to us as people of God to understand where we need to be and how we need to respond to our situation in our modern world, but I want you to also see that what he's going to tell them in 6 through 11 is that what's about to happen is God is rising or raising up the kingdom of Babylon. And he begins to describe the kingdom of Babylon in 6 through 11. So I'm going to walk through that very briefly. We're going to come back to verse 5. And yeah, I know, I'm weird. You're like, why are you going out of order? There's a reason. Stick with me. We'll get to it. You'll get it. You'll understand. Just embrace the weird. That's what I say. When it comes to Free Rider Fellowship, you just embrace the crazy because we're nuts. And that's okay. What I want you to see is in 6 to 11, he says that this Babylonian Empire is going to rise up. Remember, Babylon already exists, but it's not in its powerful state yet. If anything, it's still fairly weak. The Assyrian Empire has just begun its major decline. Other countries are beginning to jockey for position. Babylon's about to be very powerful in the next, in just the next two years. And God's already saying, I'm going to raise them up. I'm going to use them. And then he begins to describe them. And when you look at the description, he talks about them being a warlike people. They're a very good army. They know how to conquer. They know how to destroy. And literally what they're all about is taking whatever they want, stealing whatever they want. And one of the interesting descriptions in here is he specifically talks about their violence and their evil. And in verse 9, he says, their hordes advance like a desert wind and they gather prisoners like the sand. How amazing is it that before Babylon even begins their, their attacks on all the other countries that God is describing them to a T? Literally, the way the Babylonians attack other countries and other places is they sweep in with a huge horde, a huge army. They take out everybody that's fighting them. Then they take the best and the brightest. They collect them, all the money, anything they can take with them. But they also take young men and women. They take them all. They sweep them back to Babylon where they can be educated to do and to learn everything that's Babylonian. So now they have, they have the best people, all the leadership people, they're all taken. They're taken back to Babylon exactly as described, like a, like a desert wind collecting sand is how, he, is how this whole country works. And so this is what they do. But I want you to see that these are not good people. In case you're missing, he says they commit violence. Remember, he yelled, violence! 
Save me from the violence. And God's like, yeah, I'm going to do that. But how I'm actually going to do that is I'm going to send Babylon in and they're going to do violence. Mm. Anybody else paying attention to, yeah. to the interesting little balance here? Then he says, and when they get there, they mock and they scoff other rulers and they destroy everything. And it doesn't matter how high your walls are or anything, they're going to defeat you. And when they come in, he says that they're, they're just evil people. He even says that they are guilty people. They're sinful people. And that their own strength is their God. In other words, they are prideful and they follow their own strength as opposed to God in general. So this brings something we have to focus on. Sometimes God uses ungodly and horrible people and nations to discipline and punish God's people. Now listen, I didn't make this up. This isn't an opinion. I didn't just come up with this on a whim and, and just say, hey, we should just say this from the pulpit. It's in this passage, but it's also in multiple other places in the Old Testament. I'm just going to give you one example. If you just go to the book of Judges, just walk through the book of Judges and see how many times they do the wrong thing, they rebel against God, God sends a nation to conquer them. Once they're conquered, they repent and ask the Lord to save them, and the Lord raises up a judge who saves them from the evil. And then they're like, yay, we're saved, and they go right back to the evil. And then God has somebody else raise up and conquer them, and then they're saved again when they repent. And we go through this process over and over and over and over again. And these are not good, awesome nations. These are not good, awesome rulers. These are evil people, evil nations, and God is using them to get the attention of the people of God. God help us. God help us, people of God. I, I don't know what this totally means for our nation, but I know that we are in a situation where we are just as bad as the nation in the Baptist time of Judah. And what God does is what God does, and we're going to see what that means here in just a minute. I want you to see in verse 5 now, we're going to skip back to what I said was the main, the main thrust and implication of what we need to do as believers when we face this situation. When we cry out to the Lord, we don't feel like that He's actually answering us. When we are praying and praying and praying and praying and we don't feel like He's doing what we want in our lives and where He's not answering the prayer quick enough and in the right methodology that we want, look very closely at verse 5. These are the three things I want you to take away. He says, first and foremost, we are to look and watch and pay attention. He says in verse 5, look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed. What is he talking about? God's going, listen, you're so focused on what you want me to do, you've stopped looking around at what I am doing and what I'm about to do. We need to be people of God who take our eyes off of our own situation long enough to look around at the world that we're in and even the country that we're in and ask the Lord to begin to show us what He's up to. And as we see Him at work, as we see Him moving, let's praise Him. Let's acknowledge it. Let's show gratitude. Let's show thanksgiving to the King of Kings. But we got to have our heads up and paying attention to what He's doing. I'm going to tell you one of the coolest things about being a believer to me and being a pastor specifically as a believer is seeing God work in the lives of other people. Man, when you see lives change and the people grow, that's exciting. And that's that, that, that point. God's at work. God's at work. God's at work. Get your eyes off of your Yourself long enough to look around at what's going on. And when you see God working, live in that anticipatory way of what's God going to do today. If we woke up every morning going, I could be woe is me all day long. But today, here's what I'm going to do. The situation stinks. I don't like it. I want God to do something, but I'm going to start my day out by saying, God, what are you up to? I want to see it. And when I see it, I'm going to praise you for it. Start looking around. Start paying attention. But what's more is, then in verse 5, he says, For I am going to do something in your days. You know, what's interesting to me is, the second thing that we need to learn from this and take away is not just open your eyes and pay attention, but acknowledge that he is at work in every aspect of our lives and all around us. Not only like we see in Philippians where it's God who's at work in us, both the will and work for his good pleasure and purpose, but also in the world at large. And it says, I'm going to do a great work in your days. Let me assure you that God is not idle. That God is at work. He is working in the hearts of men and women. He is shaping and molding and doing great things. And even though what's about to happen 
to the people of Judah is not what Habakkuk wants. Habakkuk's probably praying, and we see it, he's praying for salvation. Habakkuk's prayer probably was like, can you just give us a good king? Can you just take away all the, all the evils and the problems and give us a nice, it'd be great if just like everybody in charge would do the right thing. In 597, when the Babylonians roll in, they're going to destroy everything that is the order and the government that's above them. People are going to be swept away into captivity. They're going to spend years there. And the nation of Israel will not be restored until the people of God have learned how to reach back out and trust Him. And then we see the rebuilding. And then Nehemiah begins to rebuild the wall. And all those things begin to happen. You see, what Habakkuk wants to happen is not what God's about to do. I want you to also notice that he says, I'm already at work. You pay attention. I'm going to do a work in your days. God is at work. He's not idle. He's working in your lives. He's working in our country. Pay attention. See it. Believe it in faith. Amen. And even when you can't see it, believe it in faith. Amen. But I'm going to tell you right now that what he's about to do may not be what we want him to do. But it's what he has to do because he's a sovereign God. And that last part, it just kills me. He says <laughs> that you, he, well, I'm about to do something that you would not believe even if you were told. It, it, it's like God could, it's like, listen, if I told you everything that I was about to do, your little brain would explode. You can't handle it. You can't handle the truth, right? And so here he is saying, you cannot grasp everything that I am about to do. But God has a plan. God has a purpose. And part of us as believers is not just looking around for what he's going to do, believing in faith that he's already at work and he's working now. But also it's about trusting that though he doesn't give us all the details, that it is his plan that needs to happen because his plan is better than our plan. You see, if all God does is just give Habakkuk a better king, then they'll be right back where they started in just another period of time. But they have to go through a period of learning to trust and have faith in God again so that then they can come back to their nation and see a, a restored nation. I don't know what this totally means for our nation. I get asked this all the time. People ask me, where are we in the end times? And they want to have these deep conversations with me about where do you think we are? And I have opinions. Um, they're just my opinions. Um, I'm not right on everything when it comes to these things. All I can tell you is this is what I believe based on what I see. And I give you those opinions. And, and, and it's tough. It's tough to look at this world and not think that we're in a certain point in the end times. But even if we're not in the end times, which I do believe we are, look at our world and compare it to the world of Habakkuk. And know, know that our nation is just as deserving of punishment and discipline as the nation of Judah was. So I'm going to say it again. God help us. But as believers, here's what we're going to do. We're going to get our heads up. We're going to look around. We're going to anticipate what God's going to do. We're going to, when you see it, we're going to praise Him. We're going to know that He's at work even when we don't see it in faith and believe. And though He doesn't give us every single step, every single point, every single situation, I like to plan. I like to know things two months out. I don't like surprises. God doesn't work that way with me. He, a lot of times He just tells me to take a step forward. I'm like, I really would like to know what we're doing next month. Yeah. You know, can you, can you tell me what the plan is for next month? He's like, shut up and take a step. Okay. <laughs> and you have to learn how to take it one step at a time. So right where you are today... Make a difference for the kingdom of God. The world has enough naysayers and woe is me Christians. What we need right now is a bunch of honest believers who say, yeah, this isn't good, but God's still in control. And I don't know what he's going to do, but I trust him. And he doesn't need to give me all the details because my brain would just explode. But rather, I'm going to trust him fully that the sovereign God who created this universe is going to get me through to the next place. And my eternity is secure. So the next day, I'm not worried about either. Can we do that, people of God? Can we be that in this world? If we can, maybe we'll see some revival in a country that desperately needs it. Heads bowed, eyes closed.
come into a time of closing out the service, I'm just going to say this. If you're in this room today and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, we're talking about putting our faith in God, and you're like, what's this all about? Well, with heads bowed and eyes closed, I want you to know that the Lord loves you. That He sent His Son to die for you on a cross to pay the price for your sin and give you new life. And if you're here today and you've never invited Him into your heart, this is a great opportunity for you to simply cry out to Him. Scripture says in Romans that whoever cries upon and calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So we're going to ask you to call upon the name of the Lord today in your heart and just ask Him to save you. And so if you'd like to do that today, just simply in your heart, just to yourself, just simply pray and say, Jesus, save me. Thank you for dying for me. I want your free gift of salvation this morning. Come into my heart. Make me new. And then say, thank you, Jesus. Heads are still bowed, eyes are still closed. I want you to know, believer, as you struggle and challenge and even question God in your own faith, just keep that conversation open with the Lord and let Him speak to you. And trust that He's in control. What we're going to do right now is as the music begins to play, I'm going to open up for a time of invitation that I'm going to pray with you. Butch is not here today, so it's just going to be me up front. But if you'd like for me to pray with you, now is the time to come.
what a song it is. It's awesome. I heard it the first service. Ladies and gentlemen, feel free to rise your feet. Feel free to dance and sing along. Feel free to stomp and stomp with joy. But I think this song, this song, we played it a couple weeks ago, but it was fitting. This is also very fitting. I didn't realize it, but this is a letter from a mother to her son. I'm sorry, I'm going to cry right now. I've never cried over this song before, but if you think about it this way, this is a letter from a mother to a son. No matter what happens, just be simple. Know that God is there. Know that Jesus loves you. And so that's all I got to say about that. So let's sing this song together, shall we?
God bless you.